everyone. Welcome to La Escuela International School. Thanks for joining us for our spotlight event about literacy and English acquisition at La Escuela. My name is Dunya Solari. I'm the director of admission here at the school. I've been here for 12 years as a parent and uh, my daughter is actually in high school and my son is in eighth grade at our middle school. So I've been through this journey of language learning for many years um, as a parent and, and as an administrator too. I will let our team introduce themselves in a minute. I just want to let you know that we will have time for Q&A at the end. You're welcome to post questions um, into the chat window, or you can just, towards the end of the meeting after the presentation, you can just um, unmute yourself and ask the question live. I will be recording this meeting so that parents who can't be here today uh, can also view and learn about La Scuola and language acquisition. All right. I actually, I see our head of school has joined us. Valentina and Benny, would you like to start our introductions? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, buongiorno, good morning. Uh, uh, it's great to see um, some attendance uh, at this very special um, meeting. Uh, I think the Spotlight series has been a highlight for La Scuola this year uh, so that we can have an opportunity to share um, all the wonderful things that happen here. And most importantly, we can also give uh, the podium to our incredible teachers um, who participate in these events. Um, they are uh, the heart of the school and they are also the people that do this very important work. So I'm very excited. This is, you know, we've always done parent education events. This one is a new one for us. Uh, so I'm very excited to be here and I'm very excited that you're all here. And thank you so much, La Scuola uh, faculty and staff for putting this together on top of the many things you already do. All right, I see, thank you. I see Sally next. Hi, hi, my name is Sally Mian peterson the Director of Teaching and Learning at La Scuola. It's my eighth year at La Scuola and I look forward to spending this lunchtime with you. Now I see Alice. Hi everyone, um, I'm Alice and I teach grade three. Um, this is my second year at La Scuola um, and I moved over from the UK um, three years ago now. Great, thank you. Sophie. Hi everybody, I'm Sophie Wirtz and I am a fourth grade teacher at the Mission Campus this year. This is my second year of teaching at La Scuola and I also do first grade English as a specialist. Thank you. Paola. Buongiorno and welcome to everybody. My name is Paola Barberi. I'm the admission associate here at La Scuola and um, also the mother of a graduate from the pioneer class from last year. I love talking about La Scuola, so please don't be shy to call if you have any questions or email, whichever your practice is. Welcome. Grazie. And Peter, Peter Kim. Would you introduce yourself real quick? Hi, my name is Peter Kim. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can All now. Right. All right, my name is Peter Kim. I'm a grade six humanities teacher and I'm also the learning specialist at La Scuola. Um, great to meet everyone. All right, thank you so much. Let's get started here with our presentation. I hope everybody can see my screen here. All right, Hi, Sally. Great. Learners listen, talk, read, and write their way to negotiating new meetings and new understandings of concepts. The IB couldn't have said it better because this is all foundational to La Scuola's language program, especially as the learners more fully participate in their own education. Our language program, and that's taking into consideration our Italian, our English, and our third language, Spanish, has three strands, that which are grounded in the PYP scope and sequence, as well as aligned to the Common Core standards for language arts. These three strands are oral, listening and speaking, visual, viewing and presenting, and written, reading and writing. In these slides, uh, you'll see the progression of our English program from preschool through eighth grade. 
and including the frequency each week. So we can pause and take a look at this frequency. La Scuola follows the Montreal model of language immersion. So you'll be seeing there's a high dedication, a high dedication to a high percent of Italian acquisition in the early childhood years through elementary. I'm gonna cover four general points about our language program, and then we'll be diving deeper into our English program. Students in the lower school, the lower elementary years are experiencing their homeroom inquiry in Italian. And as they progress to the third, fourth, and fifth grades, their inquiry is expanded from Italian to include English. So we have to pause and think of this beauty of now learning two concepts, maybe about who we are, where we are in place and time, or how we organize ourselves in the world. Two concepts through two languages that work um, side by side and actually woven together. Um, in some specialist classes, outside of the homeroom, English is spoken. So currently in environmental studies, students will have exposure to English, even in their lower elementary, through the lens of environmental studies or through the lens of recreation and physical education, as well as Singapore math. The language in the lower years, Singapore math, all the instruction is in Italian. The materials are in English. So as some educators might say, we have this opportunity to use the repertoire of two languages, to be able to be listening, viewing, presenting in Italian, and reading, writing, analyzing with English materials. Another aspect that I want to emphasize in our language program is that La Scuola prioritizes home languages. Each student may come with a language different from our language of instruction. And as we know, we have up to 30 different languages spoken at in the home at La Scuola or exposure to this language. So home languages have a place in our language program whether through inquiry, parent visits, or in the library with read alouds. So then if a family uh, speaking English, they too, English matters, both through our curriculum and also as a home language. The final uh, broad topic I want to share about is um, our faculty. Our lower elementary English teachers and that actually moves up through many of our elementary years and into middle school. They are proficient in Italian, have a great awareness of Italian, have taught in Italy, um, even as an English language if they've taught in Italy. So our English educators know Italian. They know Italian acquisition. So as we're teaching English, we're keeping in mind, what is this relationship? Where is the student in their journey at La Scuola? And how are they navigating their English? Going back to that original quote um, around our reading, listening, speaking, and writing. So those are our broad, some broad aspects of La Scuola that um, now we can um, go a little more specifically. So Dunya, if you wanna to go to the next slide to take a look at the upper elementary. In the upper elementary at third grade, that is our pivot point. Um, so at that point, we have 50-50 Italian and English. The instructional time in the homeroom is not 50-50%. And so that's uh, speaking to the inquiry. Also often mathematics is taught in English. And this, that stays consistent. And so there's this bilingual experience in upper elementary before they take that next step in the next slide, we'll see in middle school, it's 30% um, 30, 30 Italian and uh, as well as Spanish and the 70% English. So you'll see that gradual progression. Next slide. So now we're kind of parachute down into our English program at La Scuola. 
And um, the school has selected Columbia University's Teachers College Reading, Writing, and Phonics Workshop. Workshop is the style, is the type of experience that students have in the classroom. They are in the laboratory and it's really important how they're developing their understanding. So four main reasons, and there are multiple reasons, main reasons why we selected the Columbia's Readers and Writers Workshop is that it's inquiry-centered. Students are asking, who am I as a writer? What do readers do? Who am I as a reader? And where am I in my journey? The Columbia University's program has units of inquiry for both reading and writing. For example, narrative writing, poetry, informational writing, persuasive writing, which I think we'll hear about later. They're reading, we're reading nonfiction and fiction. Two more aspects is that this um, the reading and writing programs integrate beautifully with our program of inquiry. And similar to our Singapore math, we're, we're studying and we're selecting these programs that really align with our pedagogy, with our, our way of approaching learning, rather than kind of create any tension. We don't want any tension between our English and our units of inquiry. And then finally, it's very visible in this program, the progression from a child learning to read to reading to learn. And so the early elementary, they're learning to read. Phonics is a big part. Lots of work around understanding the written word. In the upper elementary, which we'll see, we are reading to learn. We're developing our research skills are critical questions. And with this, I would love to share a video. Um, this is a peek into a student in second grade. Okay. Hi, Will. Hi, Sally. Hi. I just um, was curious to hear about um, your writing experience in second grade and the process, and then I'll ask you a little about reading. That's, that sounds great. Okay. Um, so the writing process was in the middle for me. I think the part that helped is that we just did the different drafts and we're doing other things at the same time as the drafts that helped me learn more about my spelling. Yeah. And I could, and then I went to the notebook, cor corrected some of those words that were spelled wrong. And I think that really helped on my writing. And Will, I noticed we started as a tiny note on a post-it and then you went to a paragraph and then you went to one page and then you went to two or three pages. Do you feel proud of that process or the change over time? Yes, I do. Yeah, and you even added dialogue. Can you share what dialogue is in a story? And then as a writer, you learned to put the quotation marks when you had an exchange between you and your dad. Yes. Yeah, so congratulations. Can I ask you a little bit about reading? We have um, what we call snap words, are the words that we see over and over again and maybe how that helped your reading, and if you want to read two or three lines from the story. Um, all the snap words really helped me with, the re with my reading, and then as I read more of those snap words, I was able to learn more of them, and then I could, and then eventually they, I memorized them and I just know them. Great. Do you want to read us? How about there? Let's see. I don't know if we're, this is chapter two. You could just start off maybe the first few lines. Okay. Consider yourself my special guest, Badger. Clutch the red suitcase from skunk's, from skunk's grasp with one paw and took firm hold of skunk's elbow with the other. 
Great. You want to read one more? Sure. Okay. He steered Skunk away from the front door. Here we are, Badger stopped at the end of the hallway with a dramatic sweep. He, he gestured at a folding door. He set down the suitcase, pulled open the door, and tugged a chain. The bulb flickered on. All right. I'm going to go back to the presentation. Yeah. So um, real briefly, this um, student make, made a reference to uh, snap words. And that in the phonics program, um, with the with the reading, writing, and phonics workshop, um, the snap words are the most common words used in print. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, when I went back to see the passage that he read, um, out of the seventy-two words that he read, thirty-four were snap words. And and so this idea of understanding these um, high frequency or these um, often use words to have them automatic will relieve that reader so they can then focus on decoding the more complicated words. And then his mention to, and I apologize for the sound, I will um, mute myself in a moment, and his mention to being in the middle, he was talking about where he felt in his challenge, which for me is a great sign that he was neither feeling overwhelmed and it was out of reach or neither feeling underwhelmed as well. Um, and I just want to point out this book is a 2020 publication, um, just published uh, for young readers, and we're reading it as a class read aloud, and then students are participating in that, and they can choose one, two, three, four. Thank you, Sally. Okay, let's hear a little bit about uh, the benefits of this approach. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about the benefits and how this program that we use, it really develops um, incredible, it's on the screen, incredibly confident learners. Um, one of the biggest parts that strikes me about this, this curriculum that we use is the way that we link it so closely together with the units of inquiry. Um, it means that the children really see a purpose to what they're writing or reading about. They, they understand why we're doing it and they tie it in completely. Um, something that we've been doing recently in grade three, just a small anecdote. We've been learning about indigenous peoples as our, as our unit of inquiry. And my students decided that the writing skills that we've been learning, which were writing to persuade, that's what we've been doing this, this semester. They decided they wanted to use that as part of the action part at the very end of the unit. So they decided to write letters to the local council on behalf of supporting the indigenous people um, from San Francisco Bay Area. And they really wanted to use the skills that they had learned. And, and I saw them sort of click with it and think, okay, well, this is why we did it. It's for times like this. And they see that purpose, which means that they just become so confident in this, these new skills that they have. Um, as well as that, that as I, I think Will said in that video, just having that time to sort of go back, practice, edit, redraft, with their peers. So a big thing that we're doing in English is collaboration and sort of working, you know, uh, doing some peer feedback to each other, reading through each other's work, writing or reading out loud to each other and sort of thinking, how can we give feedback to each other and how can we work collaboratively? Um, and because of that, they have that time and they really build their confidence with, with what they're doing. Um, we also link it as much as we can to sort of the Italians who, for example, in grammar, um, I link it with my co-teacher who, who teaches the Italian. And a lot of the times if she's teaching a particular skill in the grammar, I will do the same in the English so that they complement each other and they really then, it's more about them grasping how to manipulate the language rather than whatever language it, will, it is. It's, it's about them knowing how to use the parts and the verbs and the nouns in a sentence, no matter what language it is. Um, and they, yeah, they just, I think they come out very, very confident and capable at the end. Thank you. Okay, so more benefits. <laughs> Um, and in terms of um, other benefits, uh, this is a question that's very frequently asked by parents, and I love answering it. Um, so starting from kinder on up, students use this Italian as a building block in both their reading and their writing. And students learn English phonics, spelling, grammar, and mechanics to develop their writing in both languages. 
when students understand these mechanics and patterns of both languages, of the two languages, they become very flexible thinkers, which gives them an academic advantage. Students have structured English les lessons where we explicitly state a Lucy Calkins um, Readers or Writers Workshop goal. And students can use this goal to help them as they read new genres of books and explore new texts in either of the two languages. For example, one of the strategies we've been working on in the first grade is retell. As Alice had mentioned, um, we're constantly using the topics of the IB units of inquiry as content for the strategies that we work through. So the first graders are currently studying traditions. So in the past few weeks, we've focused on exploring various winter holidays and traditions. And yesterday, we learned about Santa Lucia Day or um, Santa Lucia Day, the Italian Swedish holiday. And the way in which we learned this with our focus on retail was um, I gave the students the Santa Lucia book without the words and asked the students to make predictions and educated guesses before reading the book. And then after reading the book as a class, students wrote down keywords and phrases on each page, showing their understanding and overall comprehension of the book. Um, finally, I just wanted to briefly mention um, the benefit of being a bilingual um, learner as such a cultural benefit. Um, as an international school with students from um, dozens of different countries, as Dunya had mentioned, um, we celebrate and acknowledge this piece um, in both the Italian classes and English through our units as well. Thank you so much. And we wanted to cover a couple of uh, common questions that come up uh, very often. Um, do you teach spelling at La Scuola? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, our approach through of spelling, especially with English, um, is through word study. Again, the, the, that's a high image of a child. We want the children to be uh, studying and sorting and really understanding um, the various ways that a long vowel happens. So um, word study um, is the approach and word sorts are the activities. And the students are learning different patterns within a word or they may be learning different blends or different um, uh, digraphs or trigraphs. So they basically are taking a word and they're studying specific aspects of the word and understanding what other words are grouped together. So then they start developing um, like an internal understanding um, that a number of words are going to have the EA for a long E sound, for example, or a number of words are going to have those double E's to make that. And through word study, they actually step back and they think, wow, for a long vowel, we see in English, there might be five different ways to represent it. And so again, we kind of come back to this idea that students and people file concepts in their brain. So they'll file concepts rather than memorizing. So we won't necessarily give a spelling list and say, memorize this within a week or two weeks, you'll be quizzed on it is we're not able to develop those strong concepts. We might say, especially in the upper elementary, holding students accountable, study these words, let's find commonalities, let's organize our understanding, and then there's a mastery, and then we'll assess. Um, but we want that process of understanding before. And then we basically, um, there's, as you see on the slide, there are five phases of spelling, of its orthography, the study of spelling. Great, thank you. Another common question, do, you, do we teach reading in both Italian and English? We do, um, it, our launching pad is in kindergarten. Kindergarten, they develop a bilingual alphabet. It is a um, in-depth process of literacy once a week with one letter per week. Students are generating ideas for words that come to them. So it's a very creative, productive process. Um, words that might start in, with that letter in Italian or English, and then words that start with both. 
So there's this long series, if we see words on the slide now, we go from a big collection to identify which words start with the same letter. So in that case on the board, it's T or the P in the photo of the drawing. And then the students vote on which will represent their alphabet. How do you differentiate the students with advanced reading or writing skills? Okay, I'm going to talk about this one. Um, so yes, as teachers in, in every lesson, we differentiate so that we can modify our instruction to meet the needs of all of our students. And um, a big way that we do this for students with advanced reading or writing skills is um, sort of student-led approach. So um, when we're linking things to the inquiry, a lot of the time our students will take it where they want to go with it. So for example, I, we recently spent a week in my class when we were doing our persuasive writing unit talking about the presidential election that was happening at the time and we sort of learned, the, learned some of the key words and did some sort of mini debates in our classroom and that kind of thing. And through that, some of our, my students wanted to take it in certain directions and they ended up making, there's a few of them that made the Kids News Network and they made their own network of, of a TV show showing all the news and retelling it and writing some persuasive articles in there. And this is what I mean by a lot of it is they're having, them having the agency to take it where they want to go with the skill that they, that they have. Um, we will be there to, to lead them and kind of guide them through the process, but a lot of it, is student led in that way. And it, it, it means we come, they come out with some incredible, incredibly mature things for their age. Thank you. Peter is gonna tell us a bit about literacy support at La Scuola. Hi, um, yes, so for students who are approaching grade level, um, we provide support through small group work. Um, we also have for um, continuous support, we have something called the Student Success Plan where we teachers and families decide on long-term annual goals for the students and that's measured and tracked. We also provide to our kindergarten for the past several years, we provide a speech and language screening and we hope to continue that practice as well. So those are ways in which we provide additional literacy support. And then next slide. Thank you, Dunya. And I'm also here to talk um, a bit about the data as well and so I want to thank my colleagues for just providing a strong pedagogical and theor theoretical foundation for um, what we're going to see here. So this is data from 2017 um, and 2018 school year for grade one, two, three, and four. What you're seeing on this slide is the Fontis and Pinnell, um, which measures reading comprehension. And so if we're looking at first grade, you can see that in fall, students are below or approaching. And as they move into winter, that we see those levels becoming more stable. Um, but by second grade, by the end of the year in second grade, we see that our students are now moving in most, um, we see as students have shifted to approaching grade level and exceeding. And by third and fourth grade, a majority of students are now at grade level or exceeding. And this is relative to their monolingual peers. And so that's the um, data we see here. On the next slide will be information about the word stairway, which is their spelling. Um, it's not tracked in first grade. So what you're here, seeing here is um, grade two, three, and four. And we see a similar trend um, where, we, where we see that it shifts towards grade level and exceeding um, by grade four. Uh, one thing to note is, um, and then we also follow these students longitudinally. Um, so these are kind of criterion-based assessments. Uh, the next slide will show where they fall for standardized test scores that are normed against them. Um, what am I trying to say, normed against percentiles. So this was conducted in 2020. Our second graders are now fourth graders. Our third graders are now fifth graders. Our fourth graders are now sixth graders. Um, and you can see that a majority of our students are now in the 50th to 99th, um, 50th to 84th percentile with a contingent in the 85th to 99th. I do want to clarify that the standard range um, is within, I think, the 17 to um, 84 percentile range as well. Um, so we see that the patterns we saw from 2017 to 2018 continue longitudinally two years later. Um, so. Great. All right. Thank you, Peter. And in summary, is that... please. Yep. 
just to reiterate, so based on this uh, La Scuola data, grade two is where our students show tremendous uh, growth. There's a research by Thomas and Claire, I believe, that show that fifth year into the program, into dual language program, to start, when they start to um, meet and surpass their monolingual peers, by grade thir three and four, majority of La Scuola students are at grade level or exceeding relative to monolingual peers. And this trend is replicated longitudinally in standardized tests taken two years later. And something that's really exciting for me as a classroom teacher is like, you know, they, these are the data sets, but I interact with these individual students on a daily basis. So I get to see, meet them, you know, there are students that I run into. And so it's very exciting just to see um, this data, but also know uh, the individual students. Thank you. And of course, the question that's also on many people's mind is, are bilingual students as competent in English as monolingual students? Great, and the answer is definitely yes. Um, the trajectory, the, the journey looks a little different and to Peter's point, I would just wanna um, expand a little bit on um, what Peter shared and we'll see in these um, graphs that follow. Do you do wanna, All right, next slide. Thank you. So well, we're looking at a couple more graphs um, and um, this is a longitudinal longitudinal study that's over at least 30 years, looking at um, monolingual schools and bilingual schools. So bilingual independent schools are the red line. And the three graphs we'll be looking at are a third grade benchmark. Um, and these are the, the benchmark is the ERB, which Peter made reference to. And that's the often the most typical annual standardized um, test that's given in independent schools. And so in the third grade, we'll see that for bilingual schools, um, the verbal, the reading comprehension, the vocabulary and writing mechanics might be uh, lower than um, monolingual independent schools. Um, and that is also taking consideration that in third grade is the first point where we pivot to that 50-50. And then we see in the next slide, um, that there's already a growth. And so the bilingual schools will, will actually surpass uh, typically um, because they've um, had their three years, they're more immersion into English and they're actually you know, applying these, um, um, this bilingual knowledge. And so the vocabulary might be more expansive, the reading comprehension strong with the diverse um, sources. And then we see in the ninth grade, I think that's the third, is that there's, um, uh, definitely a clear path to um, progression. Who's going to tell us a bit about the growth mindset? Yeah, I'll talk about growth mindset. Um, so one of the things that we, you know, the, above all, the most important thing for our students is that they feel confident and comfortable um, with their reading, writing, their oral language, and we don't want them to feel like they can't make any mistakes with it because you know English is such a subjective subject and so a lot of the time what we'll do is we will as teachers we model the writing process as um, in as much detail as, as we want the children to be doing so so I will take them through an example of me writing it and during the course of that I will make a lot of mistakes I will change my writing I'll edit as I go and I'll show them that I'm perfectly confident and calm doing that and there's no problem and I'll ask them to help give me feedback and, and do the same to each other so that they, they gain this confidence that it, it, it doesn't matter, there's no wrong way to do it. Um, so modeling that, showing the editing process, and then they go off and do the same thing. And, and because of that, we create this sort of comfortable environment and, um, and generally they, they can understand that it's okay to make mistakes. You learn from them, it's fine. As teachers, we'll show that all the time. Um, as it says here, they develop huge confidence and appreciate, appreciation for languages. So as I said before, we teach the skills that they'll be using, not just in English, but they'll be using in Italian as well. And the sense of accomplishment. So when, they, when everything is linked to the inquiry and we produce a piece of writing that makes sense to what we're doing, it's a real life context. They get the sense of accomplishment that they actually did something to help a cause or, or did something for a certain audience or purpose. It all makes sense to them. It's all very real life context based. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing at this point and um,
If there are any questions at all, please, uh, you can, you're welcome to speak up or uh, put it in the chat. We're all here for you, for any of us. Or maybe possibly we've answered every single question that is out there. That's good too. Here's a question. Uh, can you give an example of format and experience of the assessments? What does it look like? Would like to take Alice or Sophie, would you like to take that from a, a real life? Yeah, I can start with that. Um, one thing that is um, kind of a, a piece of assessment that guides our instruction is the spelling inventories that we do. Um, we do that three times a year, and that's used to um, help us with the words their way grouping. Um, and that is specifically for phonics and spelling. In terms of the um, assessment for um, upper grades with reading, oftentimes um, it, it's a very um, it's a very varied um, type of assessment um, to kind of meet the needs and meet um, the motivations and passions of the kids. Um, so knowing that, for example, some kids are um, absolutely in love with writing. Um, there might be a summary after a book um, that a student might give. Um, and again, I teach fourth grade, so this is very much um, a fourth grade answer here. Um, some of my kids are actors and actresses, and they put together a play afterwards um, to show um, a piece of the book that they found um, the most exciting. Um, we have a lot of students that are huge artists and wanted to make this um, multi-dimensional poster and display um, of a scene in the book. Um, so these are just a few kind of examples of um, end of unit, end of book uh, assessments that we've done. Great, thank you. There's a, a question about um, how does the Bridger inspired element, how does that influence language learning at La Scuola? Yeah, um, you know, there are um, you know, number of qualities we can draw um, and connect between the Reggio and the, the English program. Um, one being the center of the relationship, and that's the relationship peer to peer or peer to educator. So as we um, move into, if we're reading a class read aloud, um, we really stop and we, we just listen and we talk and um, we ask hard questions about the context we're um, meet, you know, reading and, and um, really the dialogue and the act of listening um, is, is a core aspect. Um, and I, I really believe that is one of our central, um, you know, components that anchors with Reggio. Um, and in terms of um, and you, the, the, the writing and the, the, um, the, I, the idea that each student is bringing something to develop and further an understanding. Again, it comes to a dialogue, a provocation, an open mind. Right, and, and you know, I, I'm very happy to share the spotlight event. We have a recording of the Regio spotlight event. So if this group, group would like that as well, when I follow up with the recording of this meeting, I, will, I can also include a link to the Regio event. Uh, which I think might be interested to many. Okay, we have um, a question, let's see, about um, words, right? Helpful uh, word choices to help promote the growth mindset. Anybody wanna chime in there? Peter? Yeah. Sure. I can jump in and then it looks like Alice, you're also thinking, so. <laughs> Um, so what I always say, because one thing I hear from young children often is like, I have problems. And so my automatic response generally is uh, problems have solutions. So just get them in the mindset of um, kind of thinking about problems having solutions, but also giving them, giving them that self-talk um, ability. So, you know, after kind of repeating that, you might find that students say like, hey, problems have solutions, and they'll start muttering it to themselves. Um, I also know with growth mindset, and this is something our SEL specialist advocates is for, is for I messages. So that means using I when you're talking about what the problems are. You know, sometimes children will focus on what others are doing. And so we ask that students um, 
place themselves as the agents of their change and to be take an active role in the choices that they make. So I think that those two can be very powerful in orienting students towards, you know, understand that prompt as solutions and also understanding their role in situations. Anybody want to add to that? Thank you, Peter. Yeah, I'll just chime in. Um, I think something that I we do a lot in the classroom is breaking something down into sort of smaller chunks. It can often feel quite overwhelming, something like writing. If you're writing a, a narrative or a story or something like that, if we're asking them to do sort of too much and can you create a story from the top of your head, from your imagination, it can be quite overwhelming. And so a lot of the times I will just break things down. If I can sense that somebody's feeling, feeling a little overwhelmed into, into smaller chunks and say, okay, well then let's not worry about writing a story. Let's today just do some brainstorming of, let's think about some characters and what this character could be feeling in a certain setting. Let's, let's do some imagination sort of play almost. Um, and that seems to help make it less of a scary sort of idea um, and just sort of helps them take it bit by bit rather than having all of this overwhelming feeling. Um, so that's something that helps for me. Great, thank you. One more question about um, any, any tips on parents reading with their child at home? Yeah, it, it's a real partnership, especially when they're emerging readers. Um, and we just want to encourage um, children to try. So often it's um, reading in partnership, you know, at bedtime or in the afternoon. And then it's like a slow release of responsibility in the sense that the children will try and we just want to keep encouraging them. And that really is also that same for the writing. You might look at a you know, young child starting out to write and it, you know it's not the right way, the conventional way, but you might say, wow, you are really expressing a lot of ideas and I see what you're trying to say, or can you read it to me? And so this idea that you want to celebrate the effort, both the reading and the writing, and um, that will encourage them to stay more curious and they'll be learning the conventional ways as well. Thank you. And then another question about what are the expectations, if any, for kindergarten in terms of reading and writing levels? Really uh, arriving with the enthusiasm and excitement and curiosity. We do a lot of heavy lifting around building this um, dual bilingual alphabet. We have a, it's a print rich, language rich environment at La Scuola. Um, so we will be giving suggestions for books and activities and reading routines, um, but awareness of, you know, letters and numbers and curiosity. And Peter, I see you want to add to. Sure, I can speak to the kindergarten as well, kind of what the data suggests about like um, pre-kindergarten as well as the preschool years. So the scholarly literature actually points that verbal reasoning, so just asking comprehension students to, uh, comprehension questions to children, actually has a greater effect through fourth grade than focusing purely on phonics within the younger age group. And that also makes sense on a cognitive and developing level. So, you know, asking a young child about what's happening in the book, you know, sequencing, um, making inferences is definitely beneficial, as well as, you know, there's also been a focus in the literature around boosting a child's vocabulary. So being able to describe a similar object in different ways, knowing what are different ways, of, you know, saying like, bad or good, but also, you know, continue to expand their vocabulary. Um, so I just want to chime in there about that. Thank you. And then a question around how to, how we integrate uh, children with no Italian who may start in the lower or upper elementary years. And I'm happy to chime in here and say, you know, we do have children who start in the elementary years outside of kindergarten or first grade. And um, typically, you know, if decisions are made in March, there is a long time to, till the start of the school year, we have a wealth of Italian resources that are available online or through audiobooks or uh, through the internet. And um, we also, once they are here, we have Italian language support. Right now that's happening, I think twice a week with a teacher at La Scuola. So, um, you know, it's, it's a process, obviously, I think what is, incredibly important is that growth mindset of the parent in this process, supporting their children, um, maybe through some of the, 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 the challenges um, and staying excited about learning another language, uh, two or three languages. 
I have a question. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we joined late, so I, if it's already was covered, um, you know, we can talk about it offline, but I was curious if you could talk about, I've done some reading about um, like the science of re the science of reading, and then there's sort of different theories about these three queuing models versus phonics instruction, and there seems to be some dissent and conflict in the country around how reading is taught. So I was just curious um, if you could speak to sort of how Lascawola has dealt with those issues and kind of where you are on those, that philosophy and how that's handled, if that makes sense. Peter, did you want to touch on that or? Uh, sure. Um, one thing I kind of always lead with when I talk when I talk about education broadly is that like there's a lot of analogies between like education and the food industry and the way it kind of goes through trends. And so it seems like, you know, during my childhood, there's a heavy focus on phonics um, and kind of the pendulum swings the other way. But I do find that, you know, the answer, the truth most likely lies in the middle. Um, I do say that the way the way that PC Readers and Writers Workshop is taught is specifically 90 minutes of daily English instructions. So given that we're a dual language program, um, that's not something we're doing. And there isn't as um, the three queuing systems, which I know have, you know, there are some criticisms to it. A lot of the criticism comes from, from the research perspective is that it's hard to find quantitative measures on how to measure it. So I think uh, it's also like a matter of assessment. Um, but with that said, the way we use PC Readers and Writers Workshop at La Scuola is more as a guide. And I think one thing that we all as educators agree on is kind of what the goals are that they outline per grade. So, you know, we use as a guide, um, but then in terms of like the precise methodology, it's something that teachers have a lot of freedom. We add a lot of our regio into it and we do, um, because we're transdisciplinary, I think the fact that we're seeing content, you know, with our different specialists also boosts um, a student's understanding. And I think the other part too is that our data suggests that our students are, that um, whatever criticisms, criticisms there are, our data suggests that our, our the students at La Scuola continue be a, to be on a trajectory where they are exceeding their monolingual peers at the fourth or fifth year into the program. Um, and that trend continues longitudinally. Yeah, and I'll support, um, just echo um, what Peter says and just um, you know point out when the children are learning to read first at La Scuola, it is in Italian, which is a highly transparent and uh, phonetic. So every sound, every letter has a sound. The students, when they're learning English, they're arriving to this formal English curriculum with lots of speaking and listening, um, understanding. They have a, big vocabulary of English coming into the English program. And so as they're reading, they have a prior knowledge of, um, you know, in first and second and third grade in English, they have a prior knowledge of vocabulary. So as they're decoding words, they're tapping into their vocabulary that they know, um, which is very different from in kindergarten, they're learning and they're, they're learning the Italian vocabulary and the phonetics at the same time. So um, it's there's an advantage to learning English after Italian, for sure. Less cute, we, have, we don't depend on a, a cueing a photo to a word. We're actually tapping that child's prior knowledge. Thank you. I want to be mindful of everyone's time. We're at uh, 1.20. Uh, we're still here for questions. Uh, you can still ask us questions, but I want to say thank you to everybody who joined us now and might have to leave. Uh, it's great to have you and please join us for further events or feel free to email us, any of us with any further questions.